What's going on everybody? Uh, Jacob with you from Creek Ninjas. What's going on? Um, today we're going to talk about something a little bit different. Uh, you've been watching these videos of me and me and Ben coming out here and fishing and we're going to talk about something today that I do a lot on guided trips for bigger water, bigger fish and a lot of times for just beginner anglers and that is indicator fishing. Indicator fishing is kind of, you know, it's older school technique of fly fishing but it's more what people would call traditional ish given that you have a bobber um, but for most like older school nymphing indicator fishing is kind of how I grew up fishing and so it's something that I really love to teach and I really like to uh, just talk about a lot of times because I think it's an overlooked technique especially on bigger rivers with slower water um, and I enjoy doing it so First thing we're gonna talk about is the airlock indicator. I use two main types of indicators. A lot of times with a beginner, or if you're just fishing really heavy rigs, airlock indicator. And if you're looking for sensitivity, and if the fish are being kind of stubborn and picky and they're not hitting very hard, I really like to throw a big bushy yarn indicator. The difference is, is airlock's easier to cast. Um, it's a little easier to maintain when you're doing a guided trip, especially. Um, you can take it on an awful lot easier if flies don't get tangled up in it. But sometimes it lacks in sensitivity and it also is just a little more splatty when it hits the water. It makes a lot of noise and can spook fish, especially in low clear water. The yarn, way more sensitive. A lot of times it'll lay on the water like this, the fish will eat it, it'll just stand up, lay back over it. But sometimes these fish don't pull the indicator all the way under. So it's nice to have just a, a yarn indicator or something. Or thirdly, you can use a large dry fly like a chubby Chernobyl or something like that if the fish are looking up and sometimes they'll eat indicators. If they start eating this, I'll put a chubby on because it has a hook in it, why not? Um, those are the two main indicators I like to use. All right, we're gonna put this airlock indicator on and they do have a little screw on cap, actually, Bends on the camera back here. How close am I in frame there? Can you see the airlock? Beautiful. Okay, so you have this airlock. They have this little plastic cap. Whatever you do, if you're on dry land, it's okay. Unless you got, you know, a bunch of leaves. Don't drop that in the water. You'll lose it. But they got a little slit in them. And you just take your leader... Put it through there, put your cap on top, like that, and you screw it on there. You don't have to have it super tight. You want it to be able to slide pretty freely, but you don't want it to like when you set the hook that it just rips up the line. And that's how that will sit on there. I'm putting the airlock on first just because it's the easiest one to deal with. Um, and we talked, or I talked in a video not long ago it was actually our dumb Christmas gifts video about leader material. I don't have a tapered leader on here. I have 15 pound mono perfection looped from there to there. So it's not that much. And then I have another perfection loop right here. I attach my tippet to that. And for tippet, when I indicator fish, especially on bigger fish, I just use some Seaguar or Berkeley Vanish or really any kind of four or six pound fluoro. I'll measure this out. Pretty good ways. A lot of this water that I'm going to be fishing today is pretty deep. So I'll measure it pretty deep. And then I'll pull off just a little bit more. And I'll explain what that's for in just a second. And bite it. Use nippers. Probably better use nippers. But you're going to tie this to the perfection loop. And... What I did when I pulled just a hair extra tip it off of here, is I measure out about where I want my split shot to go. You want to usually keep a split shot, I don't know, six to 12 inches above your fly, depending on where you, how fast you want your flies to sink and whatnot. But what I'll do is I'll measure it out. I'm gonna do about eight to 10 inches. You're going to cut that again. And I'm going to do a double or a triple surgeon's knot. 
and this is going to prevent my split shot from sliding down to the fly how many of y'all have been indicator fishing or just using split shot in general every time you get hung up you're wondering why you're not catching fish for 30 minutes you go oh let me check my fly and your split shots all the way at your fly there's probably a reason nothing's hitting it because your split shot will move then you go and cramp it down harder you set the hook on a fish well guess what then your split shot cuts your tippet and you lose your fish this prevents that from happening which is nice we don't like to lose big fish fact or any fish from that minor so you leave your tags kind of long you don't really have to worry about how long the tags are take some split shot kind of running low on my split shot got to find a small one you're just going to put that above that knot just like that and my rod tip's going in Ben's uh, Forerunner's hood. But you have that knot right there, and look at there. Now it'll only slide down to that knot. And it's also nice because if you get hung up, a lot of times when you break off, you only lose that short bit of tippet. You don't lose all of this and waste a lot of tippet, which is, which is nice. So that's kind of how I go and rig up my stuff. And I'm going to... I'm going to run squirmy worm and a jujube midge and just standard tandem rigging. Um, not really going to go over that right now. We'll talk a little bit more about rigging once we get on the water. But get this tied on and we'll hop in and we'll see if we can catch a fish. And I'll kind of walk through a couple men techniques and some casting stuff and we'll see what we can get into. All right, so I've just stepped into the first run that I'm going to fish today. Um, this, this spot's a little different and in the sense that I have a lot of slow water in front of me that some fish hold in, but not a ton. And I have a faster run on the outside edge or on the other side of the river. This is a spot that I will talk about a downstream bend, which is extremely important. And a lot of people don't talk about why you need to, you know, mend downstream. Uh, first thing that I'm going to talk about before we get to that, though, is casting and how to get out there. As you can see, I have a good bit of room. I can open air cast pretty good right here. I don't have to do much water loading because I don't have to deal with a ton of trees. But you do want to start with a decent amount of line out in a spot like this because especially if you know the fish are on the far side and you can't get out there. It's probably six foot deep just right there so I can only walk out maybe a couple more feet. But to start your cast, get your flies and everything off the rod, Strip out about four or five good pulls of line. I've already stripped out probably two or three. You're gonna get everything extremely short, but you don't wanna shuffle it out. You want to lift everything up really high. Get that indicator out of the water. Get your first fly out of the water. Make a false short upstream cast. Then you're gonna come around. You're gonna do this up here. And you're going to do this one more time and get all that line out. And this is a, a long water haul. I see a lot of people, especially after they've stripped in line, they get right here, they try to do this, they do that, trying to sideways cast it. It doesn't go anywhere. The flies are already down on the bottom. You have to manually strip that in short, get them up out of the water. Then all you got to do is just drop your elbow. Like you don't even have to really push forward. You just lift up like this, drop your elbow, the flies come out of the water. Then you come back down, let out some line, throw it back down there, and now you're gonna come up and over. And what I mean by up and over is this. You're going to cast up and over. You're not going to get it down here and try to side arm it or stiff arm it. You see a lot of people that'll do that and they'll start reaching and they start stumbling. And especially if you're an older person and you have to be careful about your balance, you don't want to do this because you might fall. Um, so you wanna stay at home, your elbow is really close to you. You're just gonna lift up your forearm, drop your elbow and push forward and come up and over. And what that'll look like, get it out there, just like that. This is one of the spots like I was talking about with the downstream men. As you can see, there is a very odd current right there. 
and watch what happens when I throw on that far side and I do an upstream mend. So I get it out there where I want it, I upstream mend it, and what's happening there? My fly is now pulled out of where I originally landed it, and the drift from the start is pretty much ruined. Um, a spot like that where you have a swirling current or you're trying to fish way across to a faster current, you want to do a downstream mend almost in the same seam that you're fishing. You don't want to just barely do it. You want to do a big downstream mend. And that'll get you a good clean drift through there. All right, so I'm going to make a cast over here and I'm going to do this downstream mend and show you how good of a drift this is going to get. You just saw what an upstream mend in a spot like this will do with an indicator and it's not pretty. You get that over there. You do that downstream mend and now you see how it just rides that line. You don't have to do anything to it. You just let it go down. It almost makes like a, an L shape in a way. And you just let it keep on going. And there's a fish right there. You saw how subtle the indicator moved. That's another thing some people don't think about is how quick they'll take an indicator or a fly rather. That indicator didn't go all the way under. It just wiggled and I set the hook. I did not wait for it to go all the way under. If you wait for it to go all the way under, you're probably gonna miss most of the fish you have eat. But we got us a nice rainbow. He's a little aggressive. There's a nice rainbow. He took the squirmy, which fell out the net. Get my flies out of the net. You always want to get the flies out before you start worrying about the fish. Don't uh, start picking up the fish and letting it get tangled up worse and, and potentially breaking off flies. You always want to get these flies clear of the net, leave that fish in the water. I, uh, another one for all you YouTube haters about my big net. As you can see this fish is in the water the entire time and not flopping around, meaning that it'll actually survive. So we'll get this fish up and uh, show them to you. Let him go. Nice rainbow. Gave me a good fight. Let him go and let somebody else catch him another day. All right, so we just got one fish out of there. I'm going to see if I can pick another one up. And notice I pause every now and then and what I'm doing I'm trying to make sure when I get this water load that I'm gonna lay on this fly right where I want it I can take and do an in-air cast like this and put it over there and backhand it just like that but for people that aren't as experienced or used to making longer casts don't be afraid to water load that stuff get it back here pause it and turn around and really look where you're casting don't don't try to do nothing fancy and mess up the whole rig and notice as i'm in too i lift up and flick it to the side i don't do a roll like a lot of people do it makes a lot of noise on the water so i'm just gonna let this go down see if i can get another fish out of there and there's another one this one oh that's a good one <laughs> He's a tarpon. I don't know if Ben got that first jump on video, but he jumped right at me at 100 miles an hour. I think he got me hung up on something on the bank over there, but he did. Yeah. Now, Jacob, I have a question. Yeah. Why did you do that? Well, you know. You, you, you got to do better. That fish. No, 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 no excuses. He had some crack for breakfast, you mm. see. And no. Uh, well, see, look, now you lost your flies. There's the end of that. Good luck to you. <laughs> well, I got redemption, but we're in the back and he's not slowing down. 
So I might not actually have redemption. I might lose this one too. <laughs> These fish are getting big and they're getting mean. Holy crap. I don't want to walk down there. All right, so came up river. I lost a big one, then proceeded to re-rig and lost another big one that took me all the way to my backing and down almost to Fern Valley's property. And then it broke me off. And so they gave me the fin, kicked me out. So now I'm up here. Um, these fish are not as, you know, willing to eat. They get a little more pressure. So we're gonna swap to the yarn indicator. Yarn indicator, you're gonna rig up like an old school thingamabobber. They have the O-ring. You're just gonna put the line through and then back around this indicator just like so and you can leave it right here around this part so you can move it up and down i don't tend to like to do that as much because it will move a lot when you hook fish so i will actually pull that tag down onto the o-ring so it cinches up like that and with these yarn indicators they they'll float okay on their own but this is what i really like using to treat them as liquid high and dry. I'm almost out, so hopefully I got enough to really treat this thing. But you just open that thing up. I try to fluff it out so it goes in the the uh, floating like this, so it stays a little more like this, floating on top of the water like a flower, as opposed to that, like a matted up, you know, water dog fur that you find on your uh, kitchen table from when it's been on the table, eating everything. <laughs> y'all know y'all know how that be <laughs> what <laughs> shut up Bill. <laughs> we're being educational <laughs> i don't but know about that <laughs> you you want to let the float it drip back into the can because you just use about half of it yeah because you i called it a can it's not a can it's a it's a bottle, it's a bottle. <laughs> and, <God. laughs> all right you're gonna put that back in there. You're gonna take your hand, put it on top and just kind of work it through the fibers. This will allow it to float for a very long time. This indicator will probably float five to eight hours without having to retreat it. And usually by the time I need to retreat it, I just grab another one and normally I don't have to. So, and that'll hold up two split shots, two flies, three flies one split shot, whatever you want to put under it is probably going to hold it up. And it is extremely sensitive when a fish eats it. I'm going to try to get a fish out of this pool back here and uh, we'll see, we'll see what we can do. All right, now I'm in this a uh, little bit slower pool. Um, I'm going to talk about another mend is, this is just a standard mend, this the standard upstream mend, but I'm going to talk about something that a lot of people do wrong and that is, I'm gonna throw a short cast right here in hopes that I don't actually hook a fish. A lot of people will make a cast and they go to mend and they let line out as they mend. And that actually doesn't do anything. All that does is gives you a false hope that it's drifting right. And then when you go to set the hook, you end up with this crazy amount of slack in the system. Um, so you actually, when you mend, you're, you're not letting out line as you mend. Your goal is to fix the drift, slow it down, and let that fly look more natural with those fish. So what you're actually gonna do, once you land the fly out, you're gonna lift up the rod, mend and strip in as you mend. And you see, I have enough slack to where I can still work with it. I'm not doing this high sticking it and dragging the indicator across the water. I'm setting up to where if I have a fish hit this early on in the drift, I can actually hook it. I see so many people, they'll do this, that fish eats it. They're right here, fish is on for a couple seconds, they lose it, and they have no control over that fish. Now, watch the difference. I make this cast out, I lift up, I strip in enough, Still have slack, fish eats it, bam, I'm right here. I can come down to home, I can strip line. You got connections to that fish. That's gonna make your life much easier indicator fishing. You're gonna hook more fish that way. You're going to also be in more control of that fish and you're not gonna have your hand way up in the air like this, struggling, trying to find the reel, 
wrapping line around the reel, you know, you're just more in tune and more in control of what's going on by stripping in a little bit. But you don't want to pull in too much and drag it across the top of the water. You want to leave a little wiggle room, enough to so it's still drifting, and to where you can get a solid hook set. So I moved up just a little bit. The fish down in that run, or that hole just below here, they were pretty stubborn. I've changed up flies and didn't really have a whole lot go on. And sometimes you just gotta move. Um, you know, you could sit there and try to figure them out, but if you're just out enjoying a day and you're not really concerned about catching a ton of fish, you just wanna have fun and chill. You know, you get out and you just move around, see what happens. Now I'm faced with a dilemma though. Like I was saying a minute ago how you're only allowed to go so far with the indicator. That's where this uh, 10 foot rod, I really like throwing 10 foot rods and indicators for this reason, because now I have that extra foot. I can use that to my advantage and I won't have to get as far back like this netting these fish. I still can, you know, get them relatively close to me without struggling a whole lot. So these 10 foot rods, they really do help a lot. And like I was saying in the last video, with the client Cole that was with us, he was using this same rod. It's a 10 foot four weight syndicate and they do perfect for this. You've been, I mean, you've seen me cast this thing across the river. They do just fine. So this fish took a little uh, soft tackle. Actually, it's one of my emerger patterns. So he ate it. Good looking fish. He's got me all jacked up. Just like that, you get you another chunky rainbow on the indicator rig. This is why I tell people when you're fishing a Euro rod to reel down so you can get the fish closer to you. Guess what I can't do with this indicator? I love indicator fishing because it's what I grew up doing, but sometimes it can be a little bit of a challenge, especially in this situation. But I got it. And that's a big. Look at that. Yes. That'll be yes. Yibble. Just like that, you get you begging. That's a hefty fish. This fish probably seven or eight pounds. They're a lot bigger than they look. They're uh, very thick, but yeah. So that's just kind of a rundown of how I like to fish an indicator rig. The only drawback really is just uh, sometimes your drifts aren't as connected like it is when you're euro nymphing. You do have an issue in deeper water with a longer rig. Sometimes you can't hold that rod right here and get the fish close to you. But as you can see, it's still a very effective technique. It's not a lost art. There is time and place to use it. And I think everybody should take the time to really learn how to efficiently and effectively fish an indicator rig and just become a better well-rounded well fisherman. Being stuck in the euro nymphing world is great but it does have its limitations that you're kind of just stuck in one place especially if that's where you learn you can take techniques that you learn from indicator fishing and apply them to euro nymphing if you learn different things like that your euro nymphing will become better if you learn euro nymphing and never dive into the uh, indicator world you may never really branch out as much as some people can and so being a more well-rounded fisherman is definitely a plus and like i said come out and get you a big old fish like this or you go out and catch you a bunch of wild fish play around with it play around with some indicator techniques don't be afraid to dive into it and further your horizon of what you know when it comes to fly fishing and we're going to get a release of this guy and yeah this kind of conclude this video and put these techniques to use and let me know how it does for you